spot. and welcome to the Sunrise Safari, the biggest safari vehicle on the planet that is coming to you live from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains game reserves in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. I'm a little bit distracted because I keep hearing alarm calls, but let me introduce myself first. My name is Jamie and this morning I have Brian on camera with me and we will be conducting your live game drive along with, and I have a new introduction to make, Joffers. Now Joffers is here on an interview drive. Many of you, of course, will have been watching the Sunset Safari with the incredibly sad news about Sam. Now we are all devastated to see him go. However, strangely enough, and you know, you, you can take my word for it or you, you can't, but we actually had interviews arranged for Joffers and Yanni before we knew that Sam was going to be leaving us permanently. Now for those of you who did miss it, Sam basically unfortunately had to choose between his hearing and presenting and being a safari guide on the Safari Live safaris and unfortunately he had to make a very very tough decision. We are all incredibly sad to see him go but that is what has happened. So Sam will not be back. I know he put up a video last night, so many of you will have seen that. However, I do ask you to all be incredibly kind to Joffers. He will be jumping on with me, or in place of me, in about half an hour's time, so that he will be able to say hello to you, do a little bit of your sunrise safari, and hopefully, you know, find you some lions, find you Karula, who knows what might emerge out of the woodwork, or at least out of the bush. I have to weave you a tale of woe. And we shall weave the tale of woe whilst looking at some male nyala, some adolescent male nyala. Last night, whilst we were following that Nkuhuma lioness that we saw on Gauri Cutline, Brian and myself broke down quite spectacularly in that Wendy stopped and would not start again, despite my absolute best efforts. We had to be towed home dragged back behind the Mahindra. Very, thank, very big thank you to Brent who came to rescue us. But we did have to be towed home and Wendy will be out of commission for the Sunrise Safari. You have the pleasure of our company for the next three hours. Some very young male in Yala haven't even got to the point of acquiring their adult colouring disappearing off into the bush. And away they go. So in the next year or so, those Nyala will be acquiring that dark, dark fur coat. The horns will start to come through. At the moment, they've just got little daggers sticking out of the top of their head. And those, those tan stockings. There's an elephant shouting just around the corner. Let's go and investigate because I hear tell that Karula came to have a drink at the Juma Dam sometime last night. My suspicion will be that she's walked this route. She's gone south, I, I would imagine, in order to go back to her cubs where she had them on Little Gauri just yesterday morning. Hopefully we can locate her for you and there's always a chance that those elephants are shouting at her. Don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. We've got a little bit of navigating to do here on a road known as Ingwe Alley. Everybody watch your heads. Well done, Brian. You got it? Yeah. Ingwe Ali acquired its name as essentially an off-road track that became a road thanks to multiple leopard sightings. Ingwe being the local name for leopard. 
the name that we use on the Game Drive channel whenever we call in sightings, just so that the guests have a surprise waiting for them at the other end, rather than knowing exactly what to expect. Well, this is Ingwe Alley. It takes some twists and turns along the way, but it is a very, very popular route with our leopards. I'm just double checking that Karula hasn't come to settle somewhere along here. <laughs> I was so sad when Wendy didn't start last night. At first I thought I had stalled her until I realized that my foot was flat on the clutch and that absolutely could not be the case. And Brian and I sat in the dark for a considerable period of time. And Jen B, on the subject of our vehicle woes, you would like to know if Jigger has retired. Jigger has not retired. Jigger is taking sick leave. Jigger is taking sick leave because if you are mechanically minded and you want to know exactly what is wrong with her, her engine mounts are completely broken. And we did, we did get some engine mounts to fix her, but unfortunately they were the wrong size. As you know, it happens. There's Vehicle repairs form a very, very important part of the safari industry, wherever you are in the world. And as you know, our poor vehicles work hard, twice a day, every day. And if there's a wild dog chase, well, if there's a wild dog sighting and we go barreling off-road, we slam them through the drainage lines, we slam them over bumps that no vehicle was ever designed to have handled. And they do us proud and sometimes they just stop. That's just the way that it goes. So Wendy, in theory, the mechanics are coming, I think, tomorrow to come and help us sort out Wendy and Jigger, and actually Rusty, if I'm completely honest. Rusty's firing on one less cylinder than she should be. So Rusty makes a noise like a Harley Davidson every now and again. We've, we had a very long discussion about what Rusty sounds like last night. I personally think she sounds like a cruiser without the power. It does mean constant shifting down of the gear to make sure that we don't stall out. Ladies have been doing some road shaping. Sorry, Brian. Just bear with me one second, I just need to chat on the Gam Dr Game Drive channel. Uh, good morning Mike, there was audio of Ngala around what was a dam and Karula was on the dam camera this morning at about 3 o'clock. I'm following up trying to see if I can find her tracks. So, I'm just chatting to some of the other guides. And unfortunately, Mike didn't get my message the first time, so I'm just going to repeat that for a cookie. Uh, Karula was on the, gam, uh, on the dam camera this morning. Okay, copy that. Thanks, Mike. No Nkonzo yet, but we'll keep an eye out. So, Mike just updating me that they had two Birmingham males last night. One on Cheetah Plains going south into a property known as Inets. Now, for those of you less familiar with our geography, Cheetah Plains is off to the southeast of us. It's a property off to the southeast of us in our Traverse area, so we can visit there, go and, and explore. go and explore. And then one was on Little Gowrie, which is Karuna's favorite haunt at the moment, just to the south of our Traverse area. That's where at least two of the lions are. Now, last night, Brian and myself had a wonderful, surprise encounter with one of the Nkuhuma females. And we did a double check last night, and I must say a big thank you to all of you who sent your screenshots through. We did, or I did do a, a, a double check 
about, uh, around whether or not she had suckle marks. And the conclusion, the general conclusion, was that she doesn't have suckle marks. She is almost at the point of lactating, so she's very heavily pregnant to the point that she's going to give birth in the next few days. But it was not, it, we, none of us could see suckle marks in the enlarged screenshots. So, so many thanks to those of you who did send those through. It gives us a bit of an answer. And the good news is, given her sudden emergence from the drainage line, there's always a possibility she's going to have cubs here. I will notice that I keep swerving off to the side, and that's to keep checking for leopard tracks, just because this is one of Karula's preferred routes. And Shamsun, you were wondering where, how one can tell which leopard you are tracking based on the tracks. The, the truth is, we can guess. We don't even know for certain until we find that leopard. And that is because you never know. Despite the area that you're in, you can, you can guess which leopard it is based on the area that you're in. But leopards move around. Their territories don't have jigsaw puzzle type boundaries where you know that they will never cross. They're, the boundaries are fluid. They move into each other's areas. Sometimes, for example, if a female is mating with the male, she will follow him wherever he goes, regardless of whether or not it is into another female's territory. So the truth is we never know. In, in practice, we have got so used to seeing certain types of tracks that you kind of get to know which individual leopard they belong to. Now, males and females, it's very easy to tell the difference in leopards, just purely based on size, especially in this particular area, because Karula... Oh, I thought the starlings were alarm calling at something. But they're just on the move and unfortunately have already flown away. Rusty. Sure. Stop for a moment and the scent of petrol is spectacular. There you go. A couple of starlings in the early morning light. I think they're starlings. It's quite hard to tell. They're definitely not full-tailed drongo. I also saw some red-billed buffalo weavers fluttering about. So they could be around as well. I think let's go and investigate what has upset those elephants so much. They're calling off to the right of me. Maybe Karula's wandering through. Nathan, you were wondering on the topic of the elephants whether or not there are certain elephant herds that we are familiar with, certain females that we are familiar with. And yes, absolutely. Um, we had a long conversation with one of the other guides last night who came round and he was talking about the female with the backwards facing tusk. She's got the most amazing backwards curve and it's a very long tusk so she's very prominent. And of course all of us around the fire went, oh fang! And he was terribly disappointed in us that we'd named her Fang. He felt as though she was deserving of a different name. Personally, I love the name Fang. So yes, we do get elephant herds that we know the name of, or at least we identify the individuals in. So Fang, very, very prominent female. She's got that clearly backwards curving tusk. It's so strange when you see it for the first time. And then you get used to it and you see the way in which she has learned to work around it. Whether it's using that tusk to break off branches, and she does, it's, dom it's her dominant tusk. But like being right-handed and left-handed, for her, that tusk is the tusk that she use the most, uses the most frequently. Oh, I'm sorry. Good morning. What a nice surprise. Fluffy little water buck. Water buck calf and cow. 
the waterbuck calf of the age where it is old enough now to start following behind mum. We've had so many sightings in the last few months of waterbuck calves all on their own hiding away where their mothers have stashed them. And now, several months down the line, we're seeing them old enough to accompany the adults. Much, much safer in that way. It's one of those interesting sort of techniques that different antelope have. So a lot of the larger antelope, and let's say the waterbuck, things like Femsbok and Rhone, will hide their calves away for extended periods of time. And those little calves just have to be completely still and silent. Sable is another good example. A sable calf you won't see until you basically almost step on it when it's little. Has that one, has that little waterbuck got tiny horns? It does. Cute little boy. Yes, your horns are very impressive. Very, very impressive. I have a soft spot for adolescent antelope. There's something so gangly about them. Long-limbed and a bit clumsy. They don't quite know how to... They don't quite have the coordination that they need. And I bet that when those horns come through, it must be that kind of itchy, sore pain. Like teething, but different must be exceptionally uncomfortable because it's bone growing through the skin along with a layer of keratin. I mean, just imagine what that feels like. But what I was going to say, waterbuck aside, was it's interesting how some of the antelope have that practice of hiding their calves away and some of them will follow behind them about unless they are separated by a predator they will always be with their parents Nyala, um, type of oryx an incredible antelope that we don't get here unfortunately but is absolutely one of my favorite they will all hide their babies away and leave them lying up in a grass or a bush around here. This is one of Karuna's favorite paths to make her way back to the south. Now chatting a bit about antelope Joey in Australia. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You wanted to know because you've seen the greater kudu, is there a lesser kudu? And yes there is. In theory it is a subspecies of kudu depending on who you speak to because for some reason with evolutionary biologists they like to have a good argument about species versus subspecies. The general agreement is that it is a subspecies. It is found further north of our shores. So a bit towards sort of northern Africa. We don't get them here, but there is a lesser kudu. In the same way that there are actually, in theory, different subspecies of elant, which is the largest antelope and a member of the kudu, or at least a, a relative of the kudu, a member of the Trafalagus tribe. as well as the fact that there's actually, in theory, a northern and a southern Nyala. It's not technically classified as such, but you do find them all the way up towards the forests of Ethiopia, so right up in the northeastern part of the African continent. And what's so fascinating about that is that you can see that there was some kind of evolutionary link at a time before they got blocked off by the Miombo woodland of the sort of the central area and the rainforest of the central area or at least the forest of the central area because you've got Nyala in the north of Africa and you've got Nyala in the south of Africa and a gap, a huge gap in the middle and I mean Africa is an enormous continent so 
there was clearly something that happened that caused them to evolve and then to spread off in different directions. We've arrived at Treehouse Lakes. It has been changed. And as we cruise along the Treehouse Dam wall, which is now about twice the width that it used to be. We always used to wander along the tree house with a serious degree of concentration in order not to fall off the dam wall. Luckily for us, that has now been changed. And Beulah Ray, you're wondering if we could have a look at the sunrise this morning, since you can see an amazing pink light. Not the best view in the world, but yes, we can have a look at the eastern sky. Not terribly pink. Unfortunately, we didn't show you the sunrise in time. There you go, Beulah Ray. A nice misty morning, but not too cold compared to some of the mornings that we've been out and about. It's 17 degrees this morning, which is 62 in Fahrenheit. So really not nearly as chilly as some of the mornings that we have been experiencing. And there's a noticeable difference Brian is thoroughly wrapped up in his blanket and his buff, as he does, because he has to sit at the back and up above me, which means he gets the constant wind chill that I am protected from, largely, by the vehicle. I have my hot water bottle, of course, but it's not as, as essential as it might have been on other mornings. Onwards in the search for Karula, I have not found a single footprint. And I'm surprised by that. I expected her to walk this route. The only other conclusion I can draw is that she went a little bit further to the east, so around Twin Dams and straight back to her cubs. And a very warm welcome to one of our newest viewers, Amanda. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. Now you want to know whether or not this area is in any way enclosed by a fence or if it is completely wild. So, in theory, yes, there is a fence. The fence is very far away and the fence encloses an area that is larger than a couple of small countries. So essentially between the Sabi Sands Private Game Reserve along with the Kruger National Park, a little bit into Mozambique, a little bit into Zimbabwe, as well as a couple of other private concessions. Oh, Rusty, come on. We try, we try. Come on, we can do this. I was trying to be gentle and not launch Brian off the back. Here we go. Um, so yes, with things, places like Baluli, the Timbavati, the Kasiri, all of this extends to an unfenced area that is 4 million football fields in size, 4 million hectares, essentially, of unfenced wilderness area. Unfortunately, given, given the reality of life out here in Africa, there has to be a fence. One does not want lions wandering through livestock farmers animals nor do we want them wandering through the town so they are fenced in in certain all around the boundary of this but we're incredibly fortunate in that this area is so large that the fences are almost irrelevant in our lives so the whole area can manage itself absolutely perfectly as long as it is, or basically at this point, with the approach that it can be left alone to sort itself out. Mm. Still no leopard tracks along here. And those elephants that we're calling have gone very quiet. I can see their tracks all over the road. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my way across to the southern boundary and then I'm going to do a quick swap over with Joffers 
in five minutes' time, he's going to take over. And very kindly, the girls in final control have offered to let us go over to the waterhole camera so that you don't get the whole awkward switch of us, me jumping out and taking out all of the blankets that I have to sit on because I am a very small human being that cannot see over the front of the vehicle unless I sit on a pile of at least five blankets. <laughs> Joffers does not have that problem and he will be taking over. So we'll do a double check and then I know I can see him sitting on the back absolutely itching, itching to go and follow up on those lion roars that he heard this morning around Buffles Hook Dam. So I'll be very quietly sitting on the back and just pointing in the directions of the easiest roads to take there. And I'm sure that he is super excited to join you all and I'm sure that you will all be as you were with me a year ago, can you believe it, or almost a year ago. You were all incredibly kind and very welcoming and I'm sure you will extend the same courtesy to him. And hopefully he can find you a cat. Old leopard tracks here. And not even, unfortunately they're so old, they're not even clear enough for me to be able to show you on camera. They've been, no, no, that's not true. They're not leopard tracks, they are lion tracks. And they are fresh. There you go. The track of a lion walking south across our boundary. And speaking of boundaries, Jeffrey, you were wondering how often a lion will escape or an animal will go out of the fence and escape from the reserve. And it's funny you should ask that because there was actually a lion that managed to walk its way out of the fence line around our northwestern boundary. Strangely enough, it went for a little bit of a walk down the main road. As you can imagine, startled some people. Fences are a great thing and for the most part they will keep animals in. However, you cannot fence certain animals. Hyenas, warthogs, jackal, anything like that and cheetah as well. They will find a way to get out. So it's not even a matter of how often. They just, they do. They do every day. They will manage to make their way outside of a fence. Lions and elephants, some of the bigger, scarier, in inverted commas, scarier animals, don't often do that. So there's, it's a very rare circumstance that they will make their way out. It does happen. They sometimes are filmed walking down the road in a main, a main city called Palabora, which is one of the gates of the Kruger National Park. It does happen, very rare, and you'll be happy to know that the lion that wandered out of Simbambidi was happily and safely returned to our shores. We're going to do a check of the southern boundary. Actually, no. Hands off, Jamie. <laughs> Sorry. Before we swap, before Joffers jumps in the driver's seat and takes control of his game drive. <laughs> I have to have a good chuckle at this. It happens every now and again. <laughs> An elephant gives a sign, a, a solid kick or a push with its trunk and there it goes. And on point, an elephant trumpeting off in the distance. There's even a pile of fresh elephant dung to mark or very clearly identify the culprit. Right, so it is now Joffa's turn to take over my driver's seat. I'm going to let him do his thing, decide where he wants to go. Um, I'm releasing the steering wheel. I'm sure you'll all be very, very kind in welcoming him. Welcoming him. We're going to do a quick switch. In the meantime, we're going to send you across to the Juma Dam camera.
Good morning guys. I'm sure you've heard from Jamie that I'm known as Joffers. My real name is actually Jonathan McCormick. Um, but in the guiding industry I'm better known as Joffers. But you are welcome to call me either Jonathan or Joffers, whatever you like. So I'm actually here on interview at the moment and this is something very different for me. But it's something I'm very excited about. Something that is going to be a unique experience and I'm glad to have you on the journey with me. Let's get out there and see what we can find. I know this morning we have had some, some lion tracks. The lion tracks, unfortunately, they've crossed over south of the boundary of, of a male lion. Um, and we've had the calls of elephants, we've had some impalas calling, so we're pretty certain that he's crossed over. So let's make our way to, uh, towards the east and see if we can find some leopard tracks and we can get tracking from there. All ready to go. All right. I must say, this is something, something very different. This is definitely uh, going to be a, a very new experience for me. But it is, however, good to be back in the Sabi Sands. All right. Bit of a crisp morning today. You know, as we're heading into winter, you're really getting these cold, brisk mornings. But I must say, I do prefer it to summer. Already in summer around this time, we're getting pretty warm and the layers are already off. So to be able to wear a jersey, layer up, not a bad one. And good to see, uh, good to see Brian all, all layered up again. I must say, when we used to work together in the, in the Kalahari Desert, um, Brian used to go out looking, looking like a, a Michelin man with uh, layer after layer. <laughs> and Brian, I must say, nothing has changed. No, nothing has changed. As in, pretty nice example here, up ahead. Um, you can see this, this misty layer, and this misty layer up here, it's something quite unique. Now, especially on these wintry mornings, you can see it really nicely. Um, and we've got what we call the inversion layer. Now this layer, it's, it's a layer of cold air. So before the sun rays actually physically hit the Earth's surface and heat it up, everything is still inactive. The birds are still all fluffed up. They're trying to warm up, trying to get ready for the day. But, you know, they've also got to get to the point where they've got to have their cup of coffee and they've got to wake up. So what you're going to start to hear is you're going to start to hear a peak of the birds. And you're going to start to hear all these calls happening all over the show. And that's them waking up saying, hey, made it through the night. This is still my territory. So you other birds better stay out. And then from there on after, once it gets a bit warmer, the bird activity will slowly die down. All right. A girl, girl, you're asking, what is my experience in guiding? Well, I grew up on a, on a game reserve in Zimbabwe. And, you know, the bush has been something that I've always been passionate about. It's something that I'll never, ever leave. Um, so, growing up on the farm, I was fortunate enough to, to get experience from a very young age walking and, and driving in the bush. Um, from there, straight out of school, I started guiding when I was 18. And actually all started off with, with Brian in the Kalahari. Um, Brian was doing filming on the meerkats up there. And I actually started as a student at Swanu. Um, it, it was something fairly unique. Um, we used to do research on these meerkats. So while Brian was filming them, I'd monitor their behaviors and see what they got up to at the different times of day, what they feed on at different times of year. And it was something very interesting. And one day the, uh, the head ranger came to me and he, he told me, he said, Joffers, you're picking up today. And I said to him, all right, perfect. Now what time would the staff like to go out? So yeah, I was thinking, no, you know, going to do a staff drive and it's going to be, you know, as per normal. He says, no, you're picking up guests. And you know, I started to do one of these. And I thought, what am I going to speak about? Where am I going to drive? What is my tracker going to think? You know, I've driven Land Rovers from a very young age, fortunately. So to be in a Land Rover at least set my comfort levels. Um, and from there, you know, the first set of guests went 
fantastic. So that tire had all kicked off from my first set of gears. I got back from drive when they left and the manager said to me, all right, here's your vehicle, here's your tracker, you're off, uh, off up and away. And that's how my guiding career started. So I continued to spend a year in the Kalahari. And then from the Kalahari, I thought horseback safaris was the one. Now, let me tell you one thing, doing two four hour horse rides a day in the bush, it is absolutely beautiful and fantastic. But you do tend to walk like John Wayne after all. Um, so I stayed with the horseback safaris for, for 11 months. And from there, you know, I decided it, it was time for a change. And, you know, I'd always wished to work in the Sabi Sands and it's a, it's, a, it's a very beautiful place. So the, the sightings here are absolutely incredible. The bush is like no other. So I came to Sabi Sands to one of the reserves in the southern sector and I ended up getting the job. Now, this is a, a very different experience, uh, a new one being in the Sabi Sands, world renowned Sabi Sands. And I must say, I really did enjoy my time. And I spent two years in the southern sector. So to be out and about back in the sands to do this, this is just like being back home. Um, oh, hey, some of over here. Beautiful, all catching the morning light. You know, although the impalas are so common, they really are one of the most beautiful antelope. Okay, can you, can you hear that noise coming? This, this is now a male impala that is chasing the females around. So right now, what they're going through, they're going through there, or actually just coming to an end of their rutting season. Now their rutting season is their mating season. And it is a time of year where they've got a lot of testosterone going through them. They're looking for the females. They want to pass on their genes. Hey, every male wants to be the dominant one. So what we find in those noises that you're hearing, that is the male keeping his herd together. Uh, I'm going to try and imitate a noise of, of a male impala. You can, you can have a little chuckle back home. But what it actually sounds like, it's a... And when you start to hear this, you know the impalas are coming into rut. You know it is a different time of year. Um, and it, it's a very unique sound. So these male impalas, they come, they, they, they run and they chase the females. And one female tries to be sneaky and leave the herd. Immediately, he's around, chases them back together, and keeps them all in line. And what you'll notice is they work on a harem system. So you've got one male and many females. And this is something different for them, you know, because what happens now in their rutting season, the male impalas, they form bachelor herds and they focus on keeping condition, getting nice and strong. Because the impala males that are ready with the harem, they now only focus on mating. That's all they want to do is just mate and pass on their genes. So during this time, they are losing condition. And as they lose condition, it becomes easier for other males to come in, fight that, that dominant male, and from there, they can, they can have a battle, and it's most likely the one who's been keeping condition is going to win. The older male gets kicked out, and from there, fantastic, you know, the, the new male can, um, can pass in his genes. So it's something, something quite unique out here that happens. Um, and we just come into the end of it and come about November time, we're going to start to see the little ones coming out. As the rains come, more rain means more food, ease of survival. So fantastic. You're going to have to be watching till November to see these little guys come out. Let's carry on, see if we can find some more leopard jacks. Got to find the key first. Seem to be going forward, not backwards. So going back to the story of um, how it all started for me, um, you know, the Southern, Southern Sands was fantastic. I got to learn a lot of the different line dynamics, the, the le leopard territories, leopard behaviors. Um, 
I always like to refer to it as the days of our lives of our lions and leopards because it is just continuously changing. Um, you know, one day you'll see this lion in this territory and next day that male has now mated with a female from another pride that we've never seen before. Um, so, you know, in that sense it does get very unique to see the different behaviours. And to be out here on Safari Live, I'd say it's a, it's a great new adventure. It's, it's something that I'm, I've been looking forward to for a very long time. And just so glad to have you all on the journey with me. So, what happened from the Savi Sands is I, I made a, a move to the, the Kruger National Park. Um, which is actually just to our, to our east. So, the Kruger National Park, it's, it's connected to Sabi Sands, so it's part of the area that we call the Greater Kruger. And Kruger National Park, it's, it's, it's a beautiful area, very unique, and that's what really drew me to that area, to, to that wilderness of, to have, um, you know, pure, pure wildlife and untouched areas as such does, does an area like, like Juva. Um, you know, and it was, it was a very unique experience. I absolutely loved every minute of it. And it's something, you know, that I'll treasure forever. You know, guiding is something where you make many stories and, you know, where, where you build many, many friendships. And some of my best friendships in the bush have been made through guiding. Hence, Brian behind the camera. Good morning. Good morning. How are we doing? Well. Fantastic. Yeah. Good. Cool. You're the best side. Okay. Cool. Enjoy, guys. Enjoy, guys. Cheers. <laughs> James Richard, I will answer your question. Oh, Brian is just going to give the lens a little wipe. Tend to have a little bit of mist on it this morning. But my, my favorite animal, James Richard, I would say would be uh, probably wild dog. And the reason why I say wild dog, it is a unique animal. It is something so rare to see in the bush. And it really is just something really beautiful, you know. And I always have loved wild dogs from, from growing up in, in, in the game reserve in Zimbabwe. Um, they're always doing something, you know, and to see that interaction and, and the bonds between, between the pack is, is something very unique to see. I mean, dogs can be sleeping one second and next thing, you know, one gets up and wants to play and then everybody's pulling each other's ears and biting at the tail, especially the poor little pups. You know, they, have a, they have a tough time. Um, but you know, I'm also very into my photography and I find the dogs to be extremely photogenic. Um, something, you know, just very unique. And it, it's a species that is endangered. It's a species that, you know, many, many countries and, and, and companies and, and safari industries are trying to hold um, to come right, bring them, bring them back up to speed so we can continue to view them in the years to come. Justin, you are asking, what do I find about the Kruger National Park that is absolutely fascinating? Look, the Kruger National Park, you know, firstly, just its, its, its size is phenomenal. I mean, you're looking at, you know, we're excluding the, the surrounding areas, about an area of, of 2.2 million hectares, you know, excluding the private sites. And that is, you know, a fairly large area. You could fit the country of Wales inside the Kruger National Park. And I think that on itself says a lot. Um, you know, when, the, when Kruger National Park had first put forward the idea, it was done by you know, the president or, of the Republic of the Transvaal in 1897. Um, and the gentleman's name was Paul Kruger. And he set aside an area for conservation. And you know, I, I believe this is something very unique. It is something very special. And you know, it's, it's one of the most incredible parts 
of Southern Africa. Um, and it really is a world, world best spot, a world icon. Um, and I just love the pure wilderness of, of the Kruger National Park and the areas that it has, the river systems uh, and the mountainous areas. It, it really is something unique and something very beautiful. Um, and you know, that's what I also love about the Sands is the fact that this is wild. You know, there's the rivers, there's, you know, all these beautiful trees around. And to be honest, you know, actually, I really enjoy both sides of it, the Sabi Sands and the Kruger National Park. I love the Sabi Sands with the game view and it's absolutely incredible. Kruger National Park is amazing, but don't get me wrong, when you go out to look for an animal, it may take you a few hours, but it is breathtaking views. It is something very special. I hold it very close to my heart and I always will. All right. Andy and Julia, you are asking, do the horses get startled on, when we're doing a horseback safari in the bush? The question is, to an ex or the answer rather, you ask the question, I'll give the answer. But the answer there is, to an extent, um, the horses, they get very well trained. Um, to the point where you, if you instruct them to stand still, in a position where you've got a big game animal approaching, they will do so. And as the guide, you also let your guests know yes or no, you can move, you can't move. And there'll be times where you actually say, hey, let's turn it on and let's just gallop over the plains and go for it. Um, and the type of horse, it's a, it's a very specific horse that, that we used up, up there. This is in Botswana. Um, it's called a Boer Bird. And that is one of the, the Afrikaans names for this specific individual horse or, or species of horse. And they're actually very reliable. I mean, these are like the, the tanks of the African bush. They can go anywhere and everywhere and it really is something unique. Um, it's good fun. You, gotta, uh, you do tend to catch a few branches here and there in the, in the face every now and then. I tell you, I think one of my most embarrassing times in the bush was we, we were galloping on a similar track to this. So now we go in and we're galloping along, you know, I'm up front and I look back to see everyone, what's everyone doing, everyone's okay. And as I look back, I say, all right, guys, just careful for the branches. There's a few of them coming up. And as I turn back, oof, a branch hit me in the side of the face. And I tell you, that, 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 dented my ego slightly, you know, it was a slightly painful one. Uh, but nonetheless, we carried on with the ride and had a fantastic ride. All had a good chuckle. Um, and you can actually imagine, you know, I, I had it taken out of me for, for a while from the other guides during that time. But it was good fun. Um, and, uh, and like I said, it was a good, good chuckle. Now, just going to check over the side here. Yeah? just to see if we can see any, any tracks of, of lions or leopards. We have been seeing a lot of elephant tracks. We've heard a lot of elephant movement this morning. So now what we're looking for is the tracks on top of the elephant, because then we can identify whether it is fresh or not. From that, we can judge whether we want to follow it or whether we want to carry on to other points so we can see different animals. Let's take a look. Okay. Well, we don't have leopard tracks, but what we do have is a track what looks to be a, a white-tailed mongoose, which is something that you won't find during the day out here. Um, you know, very rarely do you see it during the day. You see it more at night time. But they've been walking all along the road up here, usually traveling just by themselves. So what we'll do is we'll carry on and see if we can find some tracks of, of a leopard. All right. So for, for the viewers out there, you, you, I'm sure you'll be able to tell me uh, what is your favorite favorite leopards in the area? Who who is the one that I should be looking for? Who should be my first leopard sighting on Juma? All right.
There's some two great dakers straight up ahead. Right there. You see them chasing them each other around? Ah, off they go. Just gonna drive up a bit. See if we can uh, see if we can get a better visual. Well, it looks to be that our, our grey dakers have taken off into the bush uh, on our right-hand side here. But something very unique about them. Did you notice when they were running there, how they were diving? And that's where they get the name the daker. It's actually derived from the Dutch word for the diver. When they're going through the bush, they don't actually run, but they rather do this little hop and this little dive. And the Dutch actually had a, a very big role to play with regards to naming the animals out here. And a lot of them are, are named after, after Dutch words. Okay. And we've got a question. Aaron is asking, have I ever seen a brown hyena? Well, Aaron, the answer is yes. The first brown hyena I ever saw was with my grandfather. We were in an area known as, as the Pielandsberg, which is a reserve that is out in the northwest. And we were driving along the one day, and just through this big, vast open area, out popped this animal. And we looked at this and kind of thought to ourselves, what, what exactly is that? So we picked up our binoculars, and we had a good look. And I'll tell you, my excitement levels shot through the roof. Bear in mind, I was only about 13 at this time. And I could not believe it. This was the first brown hyena I'd ever seen. Um, and then, Owen, when I went to the Kalahari, um, we, we were actually very fortunate. You know, the Kalahari, being an arid region that it is, you know, it does tend to have quite a few clans of, of, of the, the brown hyena. Um, and we actually had a fantastic den site up there where I was privileged enough to, to see young, young individuals. Um, and it's something very unique, you know, where, with that long coat that the adults get, um, it, it's definitely something different. And I must say, it's, it's one of the more rare animals and I really do tend to, to enjoy, you know, good sighting of a brown hyena. Just got a lot of tracks on the road here, I just want to see what's been happening. Okay, Brian, I'm not sure if you'll be able to get that up front, but what we've got here is a herd of buffalo that, is, that has moved through the area. Um, you know, this is fairly fresh. We did have vehicles that drove through here yesterday. So, judging from that, we know that it is going to be a, a fresh track. All right. But they are going the opposite direction. So we're going to carry on heading north and we're going to still continue to look for any signs of uh, the Karula female. Hear that roar of this trusty old landy. Nothing like a good, uh, good old school, ooh, 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 uh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> old school landy. Oh. Fantastic. Look, look at this disturbance on the road here. So here, um, you all love Karula. And I've heard many a story about Karula. Last night we were sitting and just chatting about the different behaviors of the leopards and hearing how relaxed this leopard is and how beautiful she is, I really would love to find her this morning for you. I think it would be something very unique. And that is our mission. I promise that is what we are going to look for and that's why we're on the search for her tracks. Once we get her tracks, we aim for her away and we're going to continue until we find her. Along the way, everything else that you see is just going to be a cherry on top. All right, we're going to check a little link road here <clears throat> to, our, to our west and see if we can find any sign. So what we've done this morning 
is we're circling the blocks because now we can identify where the tracks are going if we find the tracks and from there we can then pinpoint areas where we want to check and that is where it comes down to the art of tracking and the art of tracking it is something very unique um, you know you, you, you got to now determine a few things is the track fresh first of all once you've determined whether it's a fresh track or not what direction is it going and what individual is it what are the territories of the various animals and what other animals may influence the movement of that individual something like an elephant see a leopard who oh, he's going to chase him it's danger it's a predator okay so this may cause them to move from one area to another um, and you know tracking i'll say tracking is actually one of my favorite aspects of the bush and one of my favorite things to do um, you know myself and and brent and, and yanni actually went yesterday to to track a, a leopard and it's a very special feeling when you are out looking for this individual you know and i'm so glad that you are able to to enjoy this and, and join us on this adventure um, and and we can really you know put it across to you how it's all done and how how we go about it and look tracking does sometimes get a little bit hairy but at the same time it gets very very exciting you never know what you are going to find around the corner and what's going to be out there got a, a beautiful forktail jongo up on up on the top of the tree here and you can clearly see where this little guy gets his name from you see that fork in the tail well that's where it is that's where it all comes from and something that amazes me about these birds and you know Brian shared this experience with me in the Kalahari they have the ability to learn other calls and mimic other calls of mongoose and of meerkat and they have the ability to learn the call of predatory birds now they actually get very sneaky um, they will sit up in a tree like this and they will find you know a little little group of mongoose and mongoose have a very keen sense of smell um, and what they'll do is the mongoose will go down to a point and this mongoose will go and he will smell let's say something like a scorpion now he goes to it and he digs he digs up digs up digs up and the fork-tailed jonga keeps a watchful eye on this and he sees okay this mongoose is digging something up here so i'm going to wait in the tree and i'm going to wait until he digs that animal up and he gets himself a good uh, a good food source now the mongoose being very hungry early morning and he's worked hard for this food pulls it up and now the fork-tailed jongo starts to mimic the call of a bird of prey what happens to the mongoose starts to look all around immediately thinks danger rather save his life then have a food source so what happens mongoose poof, off they go they disappear unbelievable how quick they are they disappear into shrubs they disappear into logs into holes and this is all for cover so that the bird of prey can't find them and what happens then is this bird flies down picks up that food source and flies away and happily eats it in a tree very sneaky little fella and that's something that a lot of the mongoose have to watch out for out here. Beautiful, there he is again, up on top of the tree. So this is something that we can actually add to, to your bird list. I understand that quite a few of the viewers do have bird lists. Um, you know, and as we go along, we will look for a few of the unique ones. Uh, and we just had a, a Cape turtle dove that was just on the edge there, but he uh, seems to have flown off there. You know, I always make a joke in the bush and say that Cape turtle dove, he does one of those. And in the morning, he says, work harder, work harder. In the afternoon, something slightly different. Drink log, drink log. It's one of the unique ones of the bush. Oh. Hey, 
Aaron, you've got a question here of what is my favorite bird? Um, Aaron, to be honest, I actually have quite a few. Um, I'd say my, my most favorite one, it's actually a bird of prey. It's the biggest bird of prey that we find out here. Give you a little hint so far so you can start to guess at home. It's got a, a black back, very wide prominent chest, but it's got these little black spots on the chest, a beautiful long beak, very sharp beak, and this little crest that comes up at the back. Okay, I think some of you that have your bird list, you may know the bird I'm speaking about. It's a martial eagle. And a martial eagle, you know, I think it's one of my, one of my favorite birds, um, or birds of prey rather, just because of the experience that I had with one. We were in the Kruger National Park driving around, um, and I was actually with my family, just regular driving, we went in for the day, and it was getting fairly late in the afternoon. Now, as we were driving, this was in November, so remember in November you got your little, we spoke about how your, your impalas, they start to carve them. Um, and this martial eagle had picked up a young impala. It had flown up with this impala and it had dropped it. You know, very unfortunate, but at the end of the day, you know, we're in the bush and it is the circle of life. It is something that is tough. It is something that we do have to, have to deal with out here. But in order for one animal to survive, unfortunately, with a circle of life, others do have to give their lives. And this was a very unique experience. It was something very special to see, something that hasn't been witnessed much. And this martial eagle flew up with it and dropped it. And unfortunately, you know, it was the end for that impala. And it actually went down and fed on it for, for quite some time. Now, something of that size, you know, it wouldn't be able to keep a kill as such like a lion would or a leopard. Um, because, you know, it's very vulnerable out in the open and later on that, that kill did eventually get stolen um, and the martial eagle moved off. Um, so something, you know, unique. And I think that's why I've made it my, my favorite bird of, of prey. Um, and just the pure power of it and, and the wingspan, it is unbelievable. You'll be driving. And you'll literally look up and you'll, you'll think, oh my word, is this a small airplane coming over me? So it's, it's a very unique one. Um, but maybe we'll see, maybe we can find some signs of them. Yeah, as it gets into winter, we'll start to see a few more of them um, and a few more sightings. So let's see if we can find one out and about this morning and see what's happening. All right. So we're going to get to a bit of a, a more open clearing and we want to check up here just to see if there any elephant activity or buffalo activity. Because like we said just now, a lot of the time, the animals out here, you know, they give uh, giving alarm calls and they're the ones that help us to find the predators. So while we're on our search for Karula, your favorite leopard, this is how we're going to do it. So it's always a good idea to check the watering holes. Um, Jamie this morning when she was in, in, the, in the driver's seat, we, we checked a few and we want to check what's happening. Straight ahead, awesome. Look at the little hippo. Oh, cute man. Just want to give them a little bit of space. We don't want to scare them off. You can see they are quite, uh, quite skittish of the vehicle. So we don't want to too close, but Brian, I'm sure you're getting a fantastic view there. How cute was that little guy? I've always said, you know, I wanted to try and get a, a little hippo, but I'm not quite sure how it would, how it would go out of my room. I think I'd have to remove everything else. But you see, another reason why, why these hippos are, are coming out now is because it's winter. It's nice and cool. They can stay out longer. They don't have that pressure of the sun. And something very unique what you'll find as we head further into winter now is these animals will start to come and they relax over these banks of, of the water. 
and they will then produce something called blood sweat. So even when they're coming out now, they're being exposed to the UV rays of the sun. They've got to protect themselves. It's like a human, okay, in winter, if you don't moisturize your skin, your skin starts to crack, it goes very dry. Same concept with the hippos. And they produce what we call blood sweat. Now blood sweat, it literally looks like that animal is bleeding from the limbs. And all that it is doing, it's a natural coating. It's an oil that the body secretes in order to keep it safe from the rays, from the UV rays. And when they're going out like this into the bush, you know, they need this. Because it's nice and cool, they can stay out, they can forage for a bit longer and then return back to the water. So it is something, you know, quite unique about the hippo species. And it's something that we, we will see as we head further into winter, you'll start to see a bit more activity of the hippos lying on the banks as opposed to in the water. But I'm going to ask Brian just to have a look at our, our pathway here on the right hand side. And you can see this path. Just, uh, just going off into the bush. Um, just going off. I'm going to get out and actually show you here. Let me just unplug a few cables. I feel like Spider-Man with all these cables around. <laughs> so, what happens now? The sepe comes out of the water and off he goes. Okay, he goes now checking into the bush and he goes off to forage. But now, Something, you know, that is very unique about these pathways is the animals, they tend to use them as a highway. It's like us for the vehicle. It is a lot easier for us to drive on the road because we don't have the obstacles of branches. We don't have obstacles of holes and falling over trees and that sort. It's much easier to drive on the road than off-road. Same concept with the animals. So everything from elephant, you know, hippos, buffaloes, leopards, lions, antelopes, they will use this. And for a human, it's very important as well. Because if you're stuck out in the bush, hey, you need to find water. So you get on one of, on one of these game paths, and what happens is it, it almost forms an arrow, almost a triangle effect. So if you're ever stuck out in the bush, and you now need to, you need to find a water source, this is how you're going to do it. You're going to find one of these game paths. Okay, you're going to come down and you're going to walk on it. Now you're going to keep checking around, where are the other pathways? As you're checking around for the other pathways, you're going to notice that one in particular will start to increase in size. And then you'll start to see the movement of more animals using that, that exact pathway. And then from there, you can find your water source, fill your bottle up, and you're good to go in the bush again. So it is something, uh, something quite quite unique um, but just make sure what water you're drinking from what I'd suggest from personal experience don't drink the water where the hippos sleep in and where the buffaloes wallow because you can imagine what they pick up in the bush so the best way to go about it with these dried up riverbeds elephants like fresh water elephants want the purest of pure water so now you can imagine the underground flowing water. Um, you know, th th this is something that flows deep underground, so nothing else gets to it, nothing touches it, except the elephants will dig for it. So as we get into winter now, a lot of the riverbeds are drying up, but it does not mean that they don't have water underneath. Um, and what you'll find these elephants do, they walk into the water, so Brian, I'm just going to ask you to come up a little bit so you can see me, is they will stand in a riverbed and they simply take their foot and they will just go back and forth, back and forth. Okay, from there, they'll then take their chunk. And they take their chunk and they scoop out the dust, or the dust, let's try. They take the mud and they scoop out the mud, throw out the mud, or even better, they throw it on themselves and as they throw it on themselves, they cool it down, cool themselves down. So it's a double whammy, good effect happening here. Um, so while, they, while they're digging for this water, the sand acts as a natural purifier and a natural filtration system. So when that water comes out, it is very pure and you know, it's, it's, it's very, very clear. For us, when we go on a, on a trail, that's how we all do it. 
we will find where the elephants have dug and you just scoop out the, the remainder of the, um, the dirt and the mud and that is how you are going to get your freshest water out in the bush. And that all starts by following one of these game paths. But let's carry on. I think I can hear some elephants a little bit further up, breaking a few branches. So I would like to go and have a look, see maybe we can get lucky and find a herd. What they will start doing, start moving to the water, have an early morning drink, getting ready for the day, and then they'll go off and forage again. So this is a very good place to be right now, find that activity coming for an early morning drink before the heat of the day comes about. Let's carry on. First of all, let's plug in my earpiece so I can listen out for your questions. Can you hear that? Okay, I think we game on you. So we got a question from Justin. Um, let me get my car started first. One second. There we go. We have life again. Um, Justin, you're asking, are hippos territorial? The answer is yes. When they're in the water, they do become very territorial. Um, the best way that I like to describe a, a hippo's territory is the shape of a, of a pear, the fruit, um, and it is quite an awkward one, but you know, hippos, they're mainly territorial in the water because that's where the females will come to, that's where they hold their they, they portion of, of, of their pride really, I mean that, that, that's, that is their home. Um, and the males, you know, they want to be dominant, like we said with the impala, the males are the ones that want to pass on their genes. They want to have the females. They want to be the dominant male in the area. And when you, when you look at this, yeah, if another young individual, let's say an individual that started to reach sexual maturity gets kicked out of the pod, and he's not got to go live by himself or be submissive towards a dominant male. Um, now this, this is where it gets quite exciting. Uh, because the dominant male will then, you know, say to him, hey, you are welcome here, but you be submissive. The moment that you show any sexual maturity or any sexual interactions with the cows of the hippos, I'm going to kick you out and I will fight with you. And, you know, that, that does tend to become a problem, um, especially widely where areas are overpopulated with hippos. Um, it does tend to happen where these young individuals, they, they stumble into the wrong territory of, of bigger males um, and this does cause them some, some problems. Um, and a, unfortunately, a lot of these, these young arrogant males, you know, they, they're full of testosterone, they want to mate, um, they all want to have their own pod and these big boys take none of it. Um, and they, they really do put them in their place and show them his boss. So I hope that answers your question of are, are hippos territorial? Um, yeah, but going back to the whole question, you know, it's not necessarily that a hippo will be territorial out of the water as such. When they're out of the water, they're coming out to graze, they're going to their grazing point and they're returning back to their spot, back to their water source. Um, and I'll show you as we go along, if we, if we get some, some nice fresh hippo droppings, I'll show you what it looks like and hopefully that, that pulls it all together for you. All right. Such a beautiful morning out here. The mist has just started to lift. Sun rays are coming out. I think I'm even gonna lose my jacket soon. So what do you know to see now as well? As, as we've come through the, the different areas, um, you know, the, the vegetation is changing. So here it's becoming a lot of our, our round leaf teaks, a lot of acacias, as opposed to where we started off our drive. If you remember where, where Jamie was driving this morning, it was more of your tree species known as a combretum. And 
your combregions do dominate the area of Sabi Sands. But as we get further north, you get to these points now where you get the round leaf teaks, which are the ones we see on the, on the left and right hand side of us. Here I am. <laughs> Hello again. Um, and what you can actually notice is if you look at, at a branch like this compared to this one on my left, a lot of animals will feed on it because it's able to retain a lot of nutrients. So especially your elephants, you know, as we head further into winter, a lot of these trees lose their leaves and it becomes very difficult for elephants to find good food sources. So what the elephants will come, just like we said with the digging, they can come up to these and they can just kick it back and forth, back and forth until they get to the roots. Once they've gotten to the root, they can pull it up uh, and just like Jamie explained this morning with the tusk, they can use that dominant tusk, get under there, pull it up and they can feed on it and get the nutrients that their body needs. Because an elephant, it's what we refer to as a hind gut fermenter, which means that it's only got two stomachs. So it's not able to retain a lot of the nutrients and it's not able to retain a lot of the water. Hence why we say that they're going down for an early morning drink and most likely they'll go back this afternoon for a late afternoon drink. Uh, and then continuously feed throughout the day. And from the time you see an elephant feeding, call it about five, six hours down the line on average and it's already coming out the other side. Very, very badly digested. Um, and that's why these elephants are continuously feeding. So if you see this area in a few months time, you'll see it is going to look very different. It is going to not have all this vegetation and this greenery around because the elephants would have come past and they would have had a good feed on, on the surrounding area. Um, and you know, that's, that's all part of it. This is like a theater out here for us. It's, it's continuously changing. You know, and the bush always has something to offer. And to see all of this happening differently and you know, to see this whole uniqueness, it's, it's something pretty special. And if I was here, I'd really keep an eye on all of this and watch it as, as it progresses into the different seasons because you'll see a massive change from the vegetation. Cool, but let's, let's carry on. We're going to carry on now heading in a southerly direction to go and look for these elephants that we heard breaking the branches. All right. Let's just plug back in. I'm quite short and this is actually quite a big step up. I might, might need to actually get a step ladder for this. So you see, you remember what we said about the birds and the inversion layer? And right now, how, you know, we had that hype of activity and slowly but surely now, it's just starting to drop and the birds are now getting active for the day. They're going off and feeding. And then come late afternoon, this is when we're going to get a lot of calls happening once again. I tell you, it's gotten a lot warmer. And Brian in the back is actually uh, starting to look like a, a human again, where he's uh, lost a few layers. Um, he's not got his balaclava on anymore, so which is clearly saying something. I must admit though, this morning I was, I was a bit chilly. When, when Jamie says, you know, just bring something warm, I thought, all right, you know, not going not to be too cold. <laughs> I'll tell you what, this <laughs> is something else. Um, me and myself, I was looking like the Michelin man this morning. I had my beanie on, I had a big jacket on. So, you know, this is a, a perfect, uh, perfect temperature for me. We're just chatting about the elephant droppings. Um, I just want to show you one thing here quickly. Once I found the handle. Okay. 
And don't worry, this isn't, you know, a very disgusting one. Elephant droppings are perfectly normal. And this is going to sound terrible, but if you're ever stuck out in the bush and you need to have water, this is one of your best places to find it. And this is going to sound very gross, but what you do is you take it while it's still warm and while it's got all of that water retention, you're going to hold it and you're going to squeeze it and you're going to put your two thumbs down like that. So you're making a funnel and then you're going to squeeze it with the sides of your hand and you're just going to pour it in as you go. You're going to get the nutrients from the droppings, from the trees they fed on, from the grasses they fed on. Um, and you get a bonus, you get the water. Um, so it's something, something very different. But why I say, first of all, how I identify that this was elephant droppings, is if we, if we look at this, can you all see this, what this is? You're right, it's a leaf. Okay, over here, we got pieces of bark. Over here, we got pieces of grass. So what happens with all of this? Grass, bark, and leaves, elephant droppings. Now if we were looking at a rhino, for example, that would be something totally different. Then it would be one of just, just grass for your white rhino, or your black rhino, leaves and twigs. So that's how we differentiate between, between the, the three of them. And something very unique about this specific dropping that I've, that, that I've picked up here, this is an old colony of termites that was originally coming to feed on these droppings. So as a dropping sits like that on the ground, the termites will come into it and they'll feed on it and they'll also create almost a, a home sort in there. Um, and this now, you know, animals ha have learnt this. Baboons have learnt this, in especially. Um, and what they will do is baboons come up to these droppings, ruffle them up, pull them upside down, and as they pull it upside down, they see, okay, fantastic. She has a termite, she has food. I've just figured out now how to get my food for the winter. And that's how they'll go about it. So, you know, the bush is really working in a cycle. It really works all together. And every aspect of the bush is so important because it helps for everything to coexist. And that's why everything is different. That's why, like we just said, the different animals eat different parts of the bush because it helps to eliminate competition for feeding, which in turn it's going to then help animals to coexist amongst one another. But enough about the droppings, let's find us an elephant. All right. Take a big up again. Listen to that roar. So it sounds, it sounds as if Steph is, is out on a, a bushwalk this morning. Um, it sounds like he, he's out and about. So I mean, let's go to Steph and, and see what he's up to for the morning. See what they're getting out that side. And we'll come back to you later for an update. Isn't it special having some new faces to see on these game drives, I'm sure it is. But good morning, I know it's been a bit of a late start with the, with, the, with the sunrise bushwalk this morning, but we are here and we are on and we're gonna try our best to try and make it to the end of the show. I'm Stefan Winterboer, on camera today is Wim Dunbach. And we have been filming this morning early. We managed to film the sunrise this morning with some giraffe that we're crossing into this area. And I wanna see if we can pick up this male giraffe again. He just moved off into the tree line and it's gonna be quite interesting to see what he's been doing. Giraffe generally don't enjoy places where there's too much undulation because obviously being as tall as what they are, their center of gravity is very high and they fall over. They don't always fall over and die instantly like some articles will have you believe. Giraffe can actually take a knock, fall down and get up again pretty easy. But it's when they fall down and hit their head that it becomes a bit of a problem. That long neck that they have doesn't really have the muscle attachment that it needs to stabilize it in a whip-like motion. And, uh, and quite often giraffe will fall hard and bang their head on the floor and that is when 
they do some damage to themselves. I haven't seen it that much. I think in all of my years here in the Kruger, I've probably seen giraffe die like that maybe two or three times. But in any case, I'm not after giraffe dead here. I just want to see where he's gone and walked into the bushes here. Come with. As you can see, it's actually been a, it's a pretty hazy morning this morning. There's a lot of moisture in the air. And how I'm going to show you this moisture now is if you have a look over the treetops towards the horizon, you'll notice that there's a slight grayishness in the, in the band of cloud or band of air that's just a little bit above the horizon there that VM is showing you now. It looks like cloud, but it isn't. It is in a way a cloud, I suppose. It's a, quite a dispersed cloud. We've had a lot of moisture in the air today. Um, and it's just one of those typically May days where you just have a lot of moisture in the air. The evenings are getting cooler and that means that water is, um, is condensing out of the atmosphere relatively easy at the moment. There is still a little bit of moisture in the air. That will disappear as we start going into June and July. And you can see here some remnants of that water, that mist, that condensation on the leaf surfaces. There's shiny little dots that you're having a look at over there. That's water droplets. And why I picked this terminalia is because terminalia's leaves have got some hair on them. And those hair make for excellent condensation points, actually. And uh, almost is what gives this, uh, this, name, this tree its name. The terminalia sericea, and it means that it's a tree with terminal leaves at the end of a branch. And as you can see, at the end of all these branches are the terminal leaves and sericea, meaning densely hairy. <coughs> and I'll see if I can show you a densely hairy leaf here. Let me pick one of these leaves. You can see some of those hairs over here. Now Justin has asked me a nice question. Justin has asked, you can see those hairs there, quite tough velvety feel to it. Sorry, Justin. Justin, you asked me if, um, if there are any other edible plants in the bush. There are a lot of edible plants in the bush. Um, nothing really this time of the year. The last thing that became edible now, I think, was probably the guari bushes had their berries on. That was the last edible berry. The next time we're going to start seeing edible plants again will be from about September. Late September onwards, we will, see, we will start to see some more edible plants. There may be a few jackal berries around at the moment. And then, of course, the ever-present marula seed. So marulas, they fruited in about February this year. And marulas would have dropped down. A lot of them would have dropped down. A lot of them would have been collected by squirrels. Their fruit eaten off by a variety of animals. And then it's left with this hard husk, uh, a, a, a kernel, a pip. And inside there are two to three seeds, which you can get this time of the year. Make a fantastic sort of bush food. You bash open the, 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 the nut or you flip open a cap and inside is a seed that you can eat out. Other bush tucker around at the moment is probably... The easiest to come by is, of course, termites. A lot of termites, harvested termites, and fungus-growing termites are around at the moment. And they are doing their thing, collecting all the, 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 the uh, dry grass and the bits and pieces of wood that they can get, taking it down into their nest. And quite often, in the early morning, you have these termites returning to their nests from foraging activities. They're easy to collect. One or two big grasshoppers around. Um, I think the easiest thing to do is to say that, um, you know, wouldn't it be easier just to run around and hunt your own food and set snares? But in the wilderness courses that I've done, finding food is a difficult thing. I'd say it's probably the most challenging thing. Getting shelter is relatively easy. Uh, and of course, if you have water in places, that was just an elephant trumpeting in the distance. If you have water in places, it's also easy to, to get water. If you don't have water, then that is definitely something a little bit different. Let's see if we can find you a marula seed. I'm not seeing any marula seeds under this particular tree and that could mean two things. Either they were all eaten or what happened is this is a male marula tree, in which case it won't have any seeds. But Aqua has asked me, what are the top three or four trees that you would need to survive in the bush? Ooh, Aqua, that's a good question. 
I think it's area dependent. Here, let me see, you're catching me on a bit of it. You're going to watch the smoke start to slowly spiral out of my ears as I, uh, as I think about this one. I would say that a good firewood tree would be good. So I would say a place where there's lots of combretums. Um, combretums are like this variable bush willow right here. That's a combretum. This is what we're going to, what we'd look for in terms of good firewood. I think, wow. That is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to come back to you on that one, Aqua. Let me think while I walk over here and decide on what I want. Oh, it's actually, let me, let me answer that question. I'd look, for, I'd look for trees that animals quite enjoy, and that way we can get to see the animals. So let's start with the higher protein bushes. Definitely buffalo thorn is right up there. So we want some buffalo thorn, and we want some panicums, and we want some acacias, and we want some combretums. So buffalo thorns, some panicum grasses, some acacias, and what else did I say there, Vim? Oh, the, the, the combretums. And uh, yeah, that's about that. That's a good question there, Aqua. You had me going there for a second. I don't actually know, to be quite honest. All right, myself and Vim are actually walking around on the western edge of quarantine. Hey, look here. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how you can literally just come down to plant and find the most interesting things. Right here is a grasshopper. Now it doesn't look like much, but there is one there. It's a grass-like grasshopper. And I literally just bent down to look underneath this little stump. And there we've got... Have a look at that. Isn't that the most extraordinary thing you've ever seen in your life? Obviously, trying its best to stay hidden. Now, most insect predators hunt by sight, and their sight is triggered by movement. And so the best defense that a lot of these types of insects can have is to stay hidden and to stay absolutely still. And here we have a grasshopper, whose obviously his best mechanism is to stay looking like a grass, and absolutely still. Now what's interesting as well is on the same plant I'm able to show you the difference between a grasshopper which is primarily a daytime animal that's active in the day and stays hidden at night and a cricket. Crickets are active at night and stay hidden in the day. And I'm going to ask Vim to come out a little bit so that I can show you this cricket and here, on the top of this leaf, is a cricket. And you tell me what is immediately apparent, the difference between the cricket and the grasshopper. This is a cricket. And I'm going to tell you now, those antennae are the dead giveaway. Have a look at how long those antennae are. That is how I know that this is a cricket. They've quite often got these very long antennae. They've also got a slightly different body structure. Slightly fatter, slightly different head. You're seeing my caffeine shake translated into the leaf at the moment. <laughs> Sorry, Vim. Let's put a up. Real quick. <laughs> All right. And I think while we move on from this particular bush and go and have a look at another bush with whatever wonders it's got, and I'm sure Joffers is waiting to give you an update. And here we are again. Joff is back online. So we've had some exciting news. Is there was a leopard farm by one of the Cheetah Plains uh, rangers. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't a very thick, dense area. So, right now, we, we're currently on our way there, um, and we're gonna see if we can possibly relocate. And not 100% sure, but they did say it was a female. So maybe this is gonna be my first opportunity to see uh, the well-known, world-renowned Karula. Let's see what's there. 
I hear you had a beautiful little grasshopper with, with Steph. Always little little creatures that are interesting, you know, and I've I've always thought about how it's the the smaller aspects of the bush that make up the bigger picture. Um, you know, at the end of the day it's it's so awesome to to have a walk and a drive. You know, the drive you you see in the big game, you see in a lot more area, but the walk you can see the smaller details and you can see what everything is all about. And at home you're really getting the big picture of what does the bush have to offer. You know, this this is Africa. This is this is home for, for most of us. Um, and uh, this is definitely home for me. James Richard, you're asking, do I prefer game drives or walks? I'll say I, I prefer walking. Um, but I love game drives as well. You know, I love, I love to do a game drive to see the different areas, cover more ground, um, you know, and also get nice and, and close to animals. Um, the, the walking is something that I've always been passionate about. Uh, you know, growing up on, on the game reserve in, in Zimbabwe or Rhodesia at that time, it, it, was, something, it was something unique um, and something very, very special. When you walk in, you don't realize it, but all of your, your senses get going. You're now listening to the bush, what's around you. You're listening to the birds calling, to the lion's roar. You know, you're listening to all of the aspects. Then, you're smelling everything. Um, like those elephant droppings I just picked up, I've still got a scent on my hands. Uh, you know, those are actually quite fresh. <laughs> um, but all of these senses really get working. Your, your, your smell, your hearing, your sight. Um, you, you're looking at different aspects of the bush when you're walking. You're seeing tracks that you'll never see when you're driving. You're seeing things like the grasshopper Steph just showed you that is a little bit more difficult to see from a vehicle. Um, and yeah, some of my best experiences that I've had in the bush have been on, on foot. Um, you know, one place that I really, really love and it's really taken a piece of my heart is Mashatu in Botswana, where I used to do walking trails. Um, you know, that, that's something very special and really close to my heart. But check what we've got up here. We have got a very old buffalo bull. And by the way, that store was on purpose. You know, I just wanted to make sure you didn't have the sound of the vehicle. So right now, we let him come closer to us. Good old trusty Landy. So you see the reason why I say that this is an old buffalo, you're going to see him in the beautiful light here. Um, now if you look at his horns, they're very smoothened out. And buffalo tend to do this when, when they get these little cavities. And as they get these cavities in the horns, they go to trees and they rub their horns up against the tree um, to fill these little holes. And this is like a cork filling a wine bottle. Same concept. It's just pieces of soft bark that are going into the horn and preventing parasites from getting in there. And you can also see, you know, this, this big boy, uh, he's had a, a fair amount of, of arguments with other male buffaloes, um, missing that left part of that horn there. Shame. He's a he's a very big boy, this, but you know he's also old, um, and it's actually quite interesting. In the in the local language, we refer to buffalo bulls like this as dugger boys. Now it's called a dugger boy because of their habits. Um, dugger in the local language it means mud, so essentially what we call them is a mud boy, and this is because of their their habits. Um, you know more so in summer. When they, when they get very hot, they go into a mud wallow and they will, they'll stay in this mud wallow for the day. First of all, they're caking that mud against them. Like you can see on this, on this big uh, dugger boy, if you look towards his bum, you can see the little marks where he's been wallowing and that, that mud has stuck to him. Now when that mud sticks to him, so I'm just going to go back a second so you can keep a visual of him. Um, when, 
when he goes into that mud, all of the external parasites will stick onto that body. Okay? And as they stick to the body, they stick to, to the mud once it's caked against them, like, like Brian has just showed you on the bum. Um, and then they go to a tree. Okay, and they, they scratch, and they scratch, scratch, scratch against the tree. And while they're scratching, they're exfoliating their skin. So by exfoliating their skin, they're getting rid of parasites, number one. But a way to tell that it's an old buffalo as well is often you'll find they lose the hair around the rump. All right, and this is due to that continuous rubbing over the, over the years. Um, a lot of those hairs get removed. But just because it comes off a buffalo it doesn't mean that that hair goes to waste. This now opens up a whole new opportunity for birds to use that, that hair in their nests. You know, use it to cushion their nest, use it to keep it incubated. So again, going back to the smaller aspects of the bush, you know, the bush keeps going. It's all working in one big circle, which is, you know, quite phenomenal if you actually think about it. Um, so, you know, that's where they get the name the Dugger Boy from, the local language, the Mud Boy. And you'll notice now, you know, the game is starting to, to increase. As the morning progresses, it's getting warmer. As it gets warmer, the animals will get more active for a period of time until the heat of the day. From there, they go down, they rest, just like a human. It gets too hot, what do you do? You go inside, you have a nice cold glass of water and in, a, in, a, in a room with an AC, and you cool off. Same like the animals, you know, you're right in front of us. This is a, an AC for, this is an AC for the, um, for the animals. You know, sit in the shade, have your cold glass of water in the morning when the water's still nice and fresh, and later afternoon, and have a relaxing day. But on that note, we're going to go over to Steph with the bushwalk, and he sounds like he's got some pretty interesting things going on there, and we will catch up shortly. We're going to make our way towards the area where the leopard was sighted, and we will try our luck and see if we can relocate. See you later. I must be honest with you, we've come through this very, very sticky patch. This is a thicket that's filled with black monkey thorn and it's filled with, with, uh, with buffalo thorn. And these are the hookiest, stickiest plants that we have out here. You can see what VM's showing you over there, that hooked, spiked stick of the buffalo thorn that he's got inside there. This, in Afrikaans, is quite often lovingly referred to as the huck and stick bush. And the reason why they say that is the hook and stick bush is because you get caught up in these guys very, very easily. I'm going to see if I can sacrifice a little bit of my uniform to that. You can see how he's hooking and have a look there. Now what happens is you try and get in and it sticks you and then you go out and then back and now I'm stuck properly in this bush as you can see. And what you have to do is carefully get yourself out of there and the trick is not to let the branch go too early because the whippiness causes the hook thorn to hook into your finger and they're, oh, they're hidden by this leaf you can see there. What a vicious plant this, I must be honest with you. But one of the better plants out here and the reason why it has such vicious thorns is because the leaves are incredibly tasty for almost everything. Almost every browser eats the leaves of this particular tree, this huck and stick bush or the Buffalo thorn. Another one is this black monkey or uh, black monkey thorn that we have here. This is a type of acacia, and these now just have hook thorns. Now they've got the smaller hook thorns on their leaves. You can see there, but by far the most vicious of them all are the ones on the stem. Have a look at these guys here. Like a fang of something, to be quite honest. That thing is so sharp, it's going into my finger, even as, even as I'm just touching it. Now they're grabby, these bushes are grabby. I'm very careful when we walk through these particular areas. Now Carol has just asked me if I ever had to spend some time in the bush. Carol, yes, I have actually spent a lot of time in the bush, but I'm going to go into that in a second. I just want to show you this weevil. I've been noticing a lot of these guys lately. This is on a Peltiforum bush, totally 
different to the two trees that we were just having a look at and that this doesn't have any thorns on whatsoever. In actual fact, it's got the softest, most velvety leaves that you've ever felt before in your life. And li literally recently, and by recently I'm talking about this week, these trees have become infested with this type of bug. Now, I know it's a bug because it doesn't have any discernible mouth parts. The mouth parts of bugs, or Hemiptera, is, is the insect order that they belong to. Hemiptera are designed specifically for piercing and sucking. And this particular bug is obviously sucking the juices out of this peltiforum of this African weeping wattle. And I know it's a bug because, as you can see from quite close there, can you see him, Vim? Not really. No. Can you see? I think you've got the camera pointed. See this white dot here? See where my... Hold on one second. It's so small, we're battling to find it for you. Don't worry, we'll get it right now. Have a look there. There he goes. I don't have a clue what this particular bug is, but I know it's a bug because he's got no mouth parts that we can see. I'm going to try and turn him a little bit sideways. There you can see nothing on his head. Just sucking and piercing is what these guys do. A very, very diverse order of, of insect, this Hemiptera. Quite slow moving, very bizarrely shaped animals. To be honest, this one's covered in this dense white fur. can't see any eyes, not a weevil, and not an assassin bug, although, no, so he's just a bug. Let's have a look how bizarre that is. Why are they so furry? Who alone only knows? Fur in the, in the insect world gets used for insulation, so to help them help keep animals warm or cold. It's also used as a deterrent for bats in moths for instance they are densely furry to absorb bats echolocation and noises in this particular instance what why this particular bug would be hairy i have no idea i think it's probably for some thermoregulation for some either to stay warm or to stay cold and allow this animal to operate at levels that are potentially or at times of days that are potentially less active for other bugs and so he reduces competition that way. That would be what my brain's telling me at the moment. Now back to Carol's question. Carol, I have spent lots of time uh, out in the wilderness. I'm a wilderness trails guide and part of what I specialize in and what I love doing is sleeping out in the bush. And to be honest, the rougher the better. The rougher it is in the bush, the better for me. I love going into places that are inaccessible to vehicles, inaccessible to most people, and then setting up camp and doing exploration walks from there, or just moving through areas like that. In total, probably I've spent, wow, maybe 10 months worth, 12 months worth of time sleeping in the Kruger National Park, just in a sleeping bag or in a hammock or in a tent that you carry on your back. Relatively easy. So I hope that answered your question, Carol. No, I haven't been eaten just yet. <coughs> I still retain the function of most of my limbs. Contrary to popular belief, it's not that dangerous to actually walk and sleep out in the bush if you have the proper knowledge and you take the proper precautions, that is. A lot of buffalo tracks. Now James, while, while, we busy, while I'm busy looking through all of this vegetation, James Richards has asked quite a nice question. What is the oldest tree species that grows in this area? James, the oldest tree species that is in this area is probably a leadwood. I would say that leadwoods probably grow the longest. But the oldest tree species in South Africa is one of the olives. There's, a, there's an olive dated at about 4,100, 4,200 years old. Um, and they are just slightly older than the baobab trees. You do get baobab trees in, in South Africa as well. Not in this particular area where we are now, but definitely in the Kruger Park, a little bit further north of where we are. Literally not even much, a couple of hundred kilometers, maybe 100 kilometers, 60 miles or so north of where we are. 
And they, ha they grow to astronomical ages as well, three and a half thousand years, four thousand years old trees. I just think it's, it's phenomenal. But here in this particular area in the Sabi Sands, I would have to say that it's probably the leadwood. They grow the biggest and they're the hardest woods and they stand the longest as well. We're looking at about 600 years to about 1,200 years for a, bay for a leadwood tree, Combretum imberbi. On that note, and another hardwood of the bush, old uh, Joffers is waiting to give you an update on whatever he's found. Okay, so while, while we've been apart for that short while, we came, came across some leopard tracks, something very exciting. So we've got these leopard tracks and they're heading along this road. I can't see them right now on the side of the vehicle, but you know what? I think I've got the idea that we're going to carry on on this road because what leopards tend to do, they will go off the road, they'll walk through the bush to take shortcuts. Now you can see how the road is starting to, starting to bend around here. So as the road bends around, a leopard's not going to waste its time. It can just cut straight through on the game path like we chatted about earlier with the hippo. Fantastic. It's going to join back up on the road somewhere. So as we go in, let's all keep a watchful eye, see if we can see anything. Please, for you back home, if you think that you've seen something on the road or seen something on camera, let's work together as a team here. Let's find this leopard together. So the leopard that got called in um, earlier this morning from Chris, one of the one of the other guides, is he called it in a female. And what's quite interesting here, it looks like we've actually got tracks of a male leopard. So this could actually be two potential leopards in one area. Um, and now we're on a mission to find out what exactly is going on here, who is where, and what are they up to. You know, this is where the tracking gets really exciting now trying to establish who's who and who's where. And that's a fantastic thing about tracking. In the bush, we've got the road. Out in the cities, in the concrete jungles, you've got the newspaper. It tells you who's done, gone where, who's done what during the night. So, you know, for us in the bush, what you're looking at in front of us is our newspaper. So, right now, what we are doing we are reading it all together. And I've got the uh, trusty help of, of two chackers on the back, uh, Chacker Brian and Chacker Jamie. So we're all working together as a team as well as you back home. And we're going to see what we can find. Joey from Australia, good morning. You are asking, what is one animal that I've never seen that I would really like to see? I'd say it's more a bird. Um, and this bird is called a Narina trogan. It is one of the most spectacular birds that you find. It has a beautiful coloration. And you know what, I'm actually going to stop here for a second because I want to show you a picture of this. See, one thing I always make sure is I've always got my, my little bag of tricks with me. So I'm going to go into my bag of tricks, I'm going to grab my bird book, and we're going to have a look at this Narina Trogan. Um, and you know, the, the part of the reason why I haven't seen one yet is we don't get them in the area where I currently operate or operated in the Kruger National Park. Um, so, James, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to ask you to, to find it while, while we have a chat here. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly rare one to see. There has been a few recorded sightings in the Kruger National Park of them, but they do tend to hang around a more denser, foresty type area. One of the areas that we do have out here is, thank you, Jamie, is um, a, a, an area called the Blyder River Canyon. And in the Blyder River Canyon, this is tends to be the best possibility of finding them. I've been there twice, and I'm yet to find one. But they cannot be elusive forever. I go back into my bag of goodies with this little pair of binoculars. This is my lucky pair of binoculars, just by the way. One day these will find that Narina Dragon for me. 
And one day, I'm going to photograph that Narina Chogan, and one day, you will see that photograph of a Narina Chogan. So, look how beautiful that is. Look at, look at the colours. And when it flies, I've heard incredible things about it. It has, apparently, the most stunning iridescent coloration that comes through out on the back here and very prominent one that you can you know immediately identify it is that very red chest and the very yellow beak another very distinguishing feature about them is that eye so you can see the male he's got a lot of blue around the face so that's another way that you can identify him um, and it's actually a very nice example here of the bird species that we find here if you look at the female look at her chest compared to the male even look at her you know the different colorations on the back on the wings as well so out here um the the males are always the prettier ones you know and this is because you know we have to impress the ladies um same as the bird species <laughs> some of these birds have an exceptionally tough time there's some birds like part of the roller family they literally have to go up and um, go up and do the go up and do the, the displays where they're part of the roller family because they fly really high up and they start to perform acrobatics and they have to have this beautiful iridescent coloration. Um, same with the Narina Trogan, you know, that, that, that color is what really draws in that female. And that is all part of their courtship behavior to, to, get, uh, to get the mating rights. But right now, while we carry on for looking for this leopard, we're going to go over to Steph. Myself and Viam actually came to this, this tattoo bush, which I'm going to tell you about in a bit. And Viam remarked um, that there was this scorpion hole here that looked like it had been made by a lobster it's so big. What we're going to try and do is actually fish this scorpion out. This is a species of burrowing scorpion and they are fastidious about keeping their burrows clean. What I'm hoping that we get to see is him try and clean this piece of grass. There he comes, there he comes. I'm going to see if he comes out and he wants to clean this piece of grass out of his. Come on, boy. It's one of the easiest ways to get them out is to dirty their burrows. They don't like, they don't like the dirt. And he's got hold of this piece of grass, but now to try and fish him out into the light. Oh, I think we've lost him for today. But these burrows can go 45 centimeters, you know, a lot of inches into the ground. And it's quite safe to use a piece of grass like this. I'll show you now the end of the grass. Let's give him a few seconds to calm down and come out. The end of the grass is feathered, as you see over there. So I can't hurt him by putting the piece of grass. If I were to use the other side of the grass, this side, Sometimes the grass is quite sharp and you could actually stab into the abdomen, which is why I never use the sharp side of the grass. I always use the feathered side of the grass or the inflorescence. And it's very safe to fish them out of the holes like this. Like I said, all we're doing is we're dirtying, we're dirtying the, uh, the hole and then he comes and grabs it and says, wow, I don't want this in, and he comes and pushes it out of the hole. Let's give him a couple of minutes and while we're looking at while we're giving him a couple of minutes to come back to his entrance, I want to show you this interesting plant. It grows here on the side of these banks in the drainage lines here and is a indigenous type of plumbago. This is Plumbago zeylanica. And not only is it a very tasty treat for lots of butterflies and moths, but it's used very heavily locally in medicine. This is an abortive making decoctions of this or making a tea from this will actually cause uh, an abortion which is not a, a nice thing to do but in any case it's one of those things but what I like about this particular plant is that it gets its name the tattoo plant because of a characteristic of its root. If you take the root of this particular plant and you skin it and you lay it on your skin and you wrap up those bark touching the skin for 24 hours 
when you take the root off after 24 hours, your skin is blistered and will be blistered in the patterns that you've laid the root out. And then the blisters obviously heal. And what happens then is the scar tissue underneath those blisters is discolored. It will be a different color to your skin. And they used to use intricate patterns, whirls and lines and angles on your skin, on your back, on your chest. Um, most Africans are not hairy at all. And tattoos like this stick out on their skin and makes them look quite pretty. Decorative tattoos. Now, while I'm speaking to you, the hair on the back of my neck is raising. We've had ox pickers screaming at us. And that usually means that something was sneaking up on us. Now, I think it's actually a tree in the background over there. That tree has got a nesting site potentially for some ox pickers. I can't see the ox pickers right now. I'm busy having a look for them. I'm hoping they're not sitting on the back of a buffalo and are, in fact, sitting in that tree. They're sitting on the tree. They're sitting on the tree. Have you got them? Ah, VM with this amazing zoom that he's got on this camera. Ah, there we go, got them. Three of them. Very typical of these birds, actually four of them actually. And they have got a nest inside there, I can see. The bird on the bottom of the branch in the middle have just slipped under there. There goes another one. So they've just slipped into their nest and they'd be obviously feeding some chicks inside there now feeding the chicks pieces of scab and wound from animals as well as ticks. Those particular types of ox pickers, they actually feed on blood mostly. They sit on animals. You've seen them on buffalo all the time, I'm sure, with, uh, with James or with Jamie or with Brent. And this is where they nest in the tree. And it's nice to know because we all come back here quite often. And we'll keep an eye out, some new additions to their family. I think what we've done is given the scorpion some decent time to relax. Let's see if we can get him out now. So I'm sticking in the grass again. This is called scorpion fishing, by the way. Now, quite often they will sit at the entrance to their burrows. Let's see. No. He's gotten wind of us. They're very sensitive to vibrations. And I think what he's done is he's felt us moving around over here. And he's gone and retreated down into the depths of his hole to come out later tonight to hunt whatever is walking around the entrance of his hole. But on that note, Joffers has got an update for you. And then Tom. Okay, there you are. Now, I was just going to act like a leopard. I know we haven't seen one yet, but thought I'd throw in some humor. But <laughs> I'm really not a serious person, don't worry. Um, you know, something, something very important about the bush is, you know, traditional beliefs and medicinal purposes and, and that sort. Um, and like we said, how, how the food sources are, are slowly starting to disappear as we get further into, into the different seasons, as we get further into winter. Um, you, you may remember James stopped yesterday morning at, at this tree. Um, and this is the Zizifus macronata. Uh, the, and the, the local name for it is a buffalo thorn. And now this is the one that Jane said to us, you know, if you're ever angry in the bushes, come and look at one of these. And you just say, Zizifus. And apparently that, that's a therapeutic way of doing it. Um, anyways, this, this tree is something quite unique. And these little, little leaves can be a lifesaver to you in the bush. What you do is you just take a whole lot of them together and you put them in some hot water and you can make a local spinach. You can make a wild bush spinach, which is something pretty awesome to do. So you literally just take it and you eat it. Hoping that no leopard is marked on it, obviously. Um, this one still seems to be all right. So the reason why I actually want to show this to you is because there's a very strong traditional belief for one of the cultures in South Africa called the Zulu culture. Now, what they believe with one of these trees is if somebody in your family dies, you have to collect their soul and you have to lay it to rest at their original place where they were born. So what you do, you come to this buffalo thorn and you break off a branch. 
Now let's say I have a relative and I'm part of the Zulu culture, for, for example, and somebody has unfortunately passed away. I would grab a branch of this and just sweep it over where that individual had passed. And while I'm doing this, I'm picking up the soul. And the soul is being captured in the branches. Now what I'll do then is take that soul to where that person was born. But along the way, you have to treat this as an individual. If you buy a bus ticket, you buy two bus tickets. If you buy a meal, you buy two meals. It is very, very important that this happens. Um, and that's eventually how you get to the point of laying that soul back to rest. And, you know, another sense of this is the locals believe that if there's an electric storm out and about, and you happen to be stuck in this electrical storm, um, you don't want to get struck by lightning. So one of the techniques you can use is you come to this tree, and if you look at the, the, the nature of the branch here, Brian, I'm sure you'll be able to get through here, and you can see that zigzag effect. And to me, that directly reminds me of a lightning bolt, and for the locals as well. So if you're now on this electric storm, you don't want to be struck by lightning, you come and you simply sit under one of these, and it's said that you will then be protected from it. Um, you know, that's one of the really unique ones about it, uh, as well as uh, the whole story with the Zulu. Um, but where it actually gets the name from the locals, the buffalo thorn, is it is said that when a buffalo has been hunted by lions, it comes into here, into a little cavity area like this, and the buffalo sticks his bum in here. So his whole back is protected because no predator in their right mind is going to try to get through this. Um, so he sticks his bum into it and he throws his horns <laughs> in a figure of eight. So nothing can come at him from the front. He's protected. Nothing can come at him from the back. Eventually the predator gets so bored, off they go. They say, we've had enough of this nonsense. We're going to go look for something else. And happy days for the buffalo. He stands up and he can carry on walk off, carry on with his daily base of duties. Um, so, you know, there's something, something very unique, one of the more unique trees that we do have out here. This is one of my favorite trees that we have, just because of all the stories that it holds. Um, and the reason why I say that, you know, lions, they don't enjoy this, is there's two types of thorns in here. Okay. So I just don't want to prick myself here. It does tend to be a little bit, a little bit painful. Um, but if you, if you look at the side here, you can see a thorn pointing, pointing straight out. And then you can see one hooking back. See that there? All right. So in Afrikaans, we call this a vach abiki bos. Means wait a bit bush. Because if I had to walk through here, you've got horns holding you back but also thorns coming from the front. So you literally, you stand there and you wait for someone to come along uh, with a pocket knife so they can start to trim the branches and, and get you out of that situation. And I've been in it, it is not very comfortable and I don't really wish that upon anyone. Um, but it, it, it's a beautiful tree, it's got beautiful colors and it's, it's something unique, you know, something that I really enjoy out here. And um, definitely one of my favorite aspects of the bush. But we're still in the area of the leopard tracks. So we're going to carry on. We're going to see if we can find these leopard tracks. And along with your help, we're going to see if we can spot it. All right, let's get going. Okay. And we're up and running again. Huh. I feel like I'm doing a gym session every time I get in. Okay. Nothing like the sound of uh, your vehicle starting in the, in the bush. Okay. 
while we carry on looking for this leopard, let's catch up with Steph and see what he's up to. Now on the, on the theme of bush food, this particular plant is a jackalberry. And jackalberries not only have berries that we can eat, but they also are the host for a larvae, a big hairy worm like this called a mupani worm. And mupani worms in this particular area love to eat jackalberries. And I know because we've had some late season rains, some of these jackalberries are actually host to these worms. And they are seen as a delicacy here in South Africa. They're eaten raw, they're squeezed out, they freeze dried, they're turned into a powder, they're they are cooked over open coals, cooked in oil. The, the amount of different recipes that you can get from a Mupani worm is astounding. You're welcome to go and have a look where you're sitting at the moment. They're not the most appetizing looking worms, I must be honest with you. It's M-O-P-A-N-E, worm. Go and have a look there and see what I'm busy looking for. Giant worm. And I, this particular jackalberry doesn't look like it actually has any caterpillars eating on it now, but you know, it always helps to have a decent look inside one of these things to see if you can see. Now I'm getting spider webs all over my face. I don't see any to be honest. Might just be a little bit too late for them. Ah, but what we do have. Moth, yeah. yeah, this is, we've been seeing this moth around. In actual fact, Viam, if you come around this side, sorry, this is one of these moths that's got two faces. He's got a face on the front of his body right, the one that's looking at the right-hand side of your screen now. And then there's a face at the back of his body, a pseudo face. He's busy rubbing his wings together there to make it look like his head. Ah, there he's opening up. Have a look at how pretty that is. Wow. Good. How revealing is that? He went from this camouflaged animal with two heads to this unbelievably mauvey, beautiful blue color. I have no idea what butterfly this is. That's Brent's domain. What I can tell you though is that the, he's orientated himself perpendicular to the sun and that's so that the fluid in his wings can warm up. So butterflies have those big wide wings, it heats up the fluid, fluid goes into their body warm like a big radiator and they then get active in the middle of the day. It's the time of the butterflies is the middle of the day. It's, it's when it's hottest you have the most butterflies out and that's because they can really operate in that range. Their wings are fantastic radiators, keeps them cool, warms them up um, and on top of all of that they also look good and so obviously it's a natural place to put your most colors, your most colors on and the scales on a butterfly's wings. Ah, oh, there we go. So he obviously had warmed up enough to fly away. I want to show you something else. Vim, come stand this side, sorry. We had a look at this little grasshopper a little bit earlier and I think that this particular grasshopper is actually making himself look like a piece of bird dropping. Now we were mulling over the reason why and I think that this particular grasshopper looks like a bird dropping simply because if you are if you are the prey species, if you are going to be dinner for a bird, the best way to hide from a bird is to look like it's droppings. And I think that that is exactly what this little grasshopper has tried to do. It's tried to mimic a bird's dropping and in so doing is left alone by the birds. Quite nice, eh? Isn't it interesting? Almost every single tree that we walk up to has got something going on. Absolutely. And we'll carry on exploring this wonderful little drainage line. And rather than have a look at my shiny bald head disappear into the thicket in the front there, Joffers has probably got something very interesting to tell you. Okay, and here we are now again. We've just come past a, a riverbed. You know, when we're looking for our, our leopards, a fantastic place to look is these riverbeds. They do tend to hang around in them because the vegetation does tend to be a little bit thicker. So, if you look at a leopard, how it is built, it is built for stealth and strength. So, when they're in the riverbed, they are in their prime hunting zone. They can give a 23 second or 23 meters per second burst and they can really quickly jump onto something. 
So we came into this riverbed um, to check what was, what was happening, see if we could find any sign of the leopards. And we bumped into a, a little bit of a grumpy bull elephant. Um, he seems to have woken up on the wrong side of the termite mound this morning. Um, so we, we're going to give him a little bit of space. You know, we don't want to disturb them. We want them to be as comfortable with us as we are with them. So rather, we're going to carry on. We're going to continue looking for our leopards. And we'll make a loop around and see if we can find any further sign. Okay. And you won't believe it. Up ahead. We're going to laser spot an African vehicle. <laughs> uh, just a transfer vehicle. <laughs> yeah, I'm full. Justin, you've got a question of what does South Africa have to offer that nowhere else in the world does. Um, Justin, I'd say it's, it's one of the most unique areas for, for game viewing experiences. Um, you know, when you, when you come to an area like this, there's so much diversity around. You know, there's always something different to look at, always different animal behaviors everywhere you go throughout this country um, and it, it's something beautiful I mean it's something that you, you'll find different adventures in different countries like New Zealand I mean the land of adventure Africa you know the continent of safari and more specifically South Africa you know and that's why you know I, I particularly love South Africa I've guided in Botswana and it was fantastic and I, I absolutely loved it but you know what they say, how huh? they say that there is really no place like home. Um, and I really do feel at home in the South African bush, you know, around the Kruger National Park where it is, and the Sabi Sands where it's just undisturbed. And, you know, it's, it's something very special and hold it close to my heart. Ah, oh, there's a cat. Okay, not a real cat, not an animal cat, but it's a cat bulldozer. <laughs> um, well, what they're doing there is they're just building a, a dam, extending a dam. As we head into winter, you know, we, we are going to need the water sources out and about. So this is just plans that we put forward to, to help, help the uh, animals out. Oh, right, look at that. It's a, it's a whole pride of them. <laughs> Big ones, small ones. Oh, fantastic, man. The morning's heating up. Okay. So I hear that um, you're, you're looking for some Mapani worms this morning with Steph. And, you know, I, I must say, there's nothing like a good crunchy uh, Mapani worm. Um, you know, for, for the birds, they, they absolutely love it. Um, sometimes I love it too. <laughs> um, no, just jokes. But for, for the birds, you know, it's a great nutritional food source for them. And, you know, it's something that they'll often go after uh, during the tough times in the bush. And, you know, we have had a, a fairly dry year. Last year, we didn't receive our regular annual rainfall. So a lot of the, a lot of the parts of the bush are starting to deteriorate a lot quicker than normal this year. Um, so that's why we're finding the animals taking different, different roles and, and feeding on different parts of the bush. Something like a buffalo that is regularly uh, a grazer, you know, I've now noticed how the buffaloes are starting to become browsers and they're starting to feed on the leaves. Because remember, your grazer feeds primarily on grasses, your browser feeds on the leaves. So your buffalo is going from a grazer to start browsing or to keep those nutrients going. But why I've stopped here on that note, um, you know, to keep the body supplemented, is we've got something on the right here that you you see all all over the bush. Now, this here, this is a a bone. Um, yeah, there's not much left of it, so I can't tell you exactly what it was. Um, 
But talking about supplementing the diets of these animals, if you look at the top here, you can see how it's been gnawed and it's been chewed on. Just on, on the top there. Okay, and the animals out here, they have to practice something very specific called osteophagia. Now what osteophagia is, it's a practicing of eating bones to get the calcium the body requires. So a lot of the time, they can't get it from this vegetation that they feed on. They've got to look at other ways to supplement the diet. Now what you may have seen back at home, you may have seen your dogs, where they go and they lick the soil. They often do it in areas with, that are very red in soil because it's very high in iron content. So that's how they get the iron. The animals out here do it, buffaloes I've seen do it many a time. Um, and even the bones, buffaloes will suck on a bone. Impalas, giraffe. So sometimes you can have good fun with that. Um, so let's get you a little bit closer here and just show you exactly where, where these animals are eaten. And you can actually see how there's been a, a chip taken out of there. And you see that there. And you know, this is this is fantastic for them. But at the same time, it's not just the hyenas that do the cleaning up. They clean up the bones after a carcass. This goes a lot deeper. So now, let's say I'm, I'm an impala. I come here, I pick up this bone, and I take it, and you know, I get the calcium my body needs, and I carry on walking, and then I drop it. Okay, what's just happened there? The bones, they've been dispersed. So what's happening is a dispersal of the bones is eventually going to disintegrate, and that calcium will go back into the soil that is left. So by that calcium going into the soil, you get calcium-rich soil, which at the end of the day, you get fantastic greenery coming through. And again, it goes back to the whole circle of life and how the bush goes around in one big, one big circle. So it is something very important out here, it's something very special, very unique, and it's these smaller aspects, like we said just now, that make up the bigger picture. And, um, you know, something like of this size, something like this, most likely it was bitten in half by a hyena. Um, and out here we refer to our, our hyena as a spotted hyena, um, it's, it's the, the one that we found in this region. Um, so literally he would have come, taken his jaw, whack, uh, got in through it, get into, got to nice bone marrow, perfect, and that sort of comes out as, and that opens up a, a, a dietary supplement for the rest of the animals. So it is something important, and something that we will see quite a bit out here, but like you can see, this is a perfect example, because there's no other bones. All right, this is a barren area, there's no other bones, the carcass was not originally here. If it was, we would most likely see a head, the horns, you know, and a bit more signs, sometimes the hooves and that sort. Okay, but let's carry on, let's see what else we can find. The morning is starting to, to heat up quite nicely, um, so we're going to keep moving. But something very important here, you can see where I picked up this bone from and the way that it was placed. It's very important that when we do return something to where we picked it up, that we put it back in exactly the same spot. Just by going, just like that, back here, home he goes. And the reason why I say that this is so important is an animal could be starting off a home underneath that bone. And we don't want anybody to ruin this. We don't want people to come into our home and ruin our homes exactly the same as the animals don't want anybody to come in and ruin their homes. So it's something important. You know, at the end of the day, we need to respect the bush, and the bush respects us. So it works both ways. And that, you know, at the end of the day, we get rewarded with fantastic sightings, everyone's happy, and everyone goes home happy. But let's carry on. Let's see what else is out there. Okay. So one second, just going to pop my earpiece back on so I can get your questions. And we aim for a way, so I ask a way. Okay.
So you can hear now as you've been going how the bird activity has slowly started to, to drop off and slowly started to uh, get, get quiet. Um, but what we're going to do now as we carry on, we'll link back to Steph. The only way that we got to see this particular amazing animal was because he was crossing this tiny open patch of sand that you can see him on. But can you believe that this is a praying mantis, a grass-like praying mantis? And his obvious hunting grounds are dead sticks and dead branches and he must be having the absolute best time at the moment. Now as I mentioned, insects hunt by movement this particular little insect predator would be looking for movement and would react very well to movement. Those enormous eyes that he has on top of his head. <coughs> he has his head, whoa, <laughs> there he goes. Okay, let me see if we can get him. It's gonna be a bit tough to find frame again, so just give us a little bit of patience. But basically, underneath the grass is where he is sitting at the moment. Trying his best to look like a stick and doing a very, very good job at it. Those enormous eyes would be very, very, very susceptible to movement. Oh, there he goes again. Here he is here, Vim. Here we go. Isn't that just the most amazing thing? So, praying mantis hunt by stealth. They will then react to movement, shoot out those forearms, and with those quite long forms in actual fact scoop up the prey right at these forms these are curved inwards this is a double form it actually flaps open and forms a hook with quite nasty spines on it to be quite honest and he'll immobilize the prey there are actually two arms here it's not just one he's just holding them together to look more like a stick two arms here holding the prey bring up to the mouth and quite often just decapitated have a look at how he's watching this grass here Oh, isn't it just amazing? Long legs for getting through the grass and the undergrowth. Very actively just watching us and watching and seeing that we're not going to step on him, which of course I'm going to try not to do. And then I think we can leave him alone. He's given us. He's going to go into the grass there and away. Amazing, eh? Oh, I just love these things, to be honest. For me, there's nothing better than looking at one of these little guys hunting. I had the pleasure the other day of watching one of these, or a similar grasshopper, <coughs> I mean, uh, praying mantis, hunt a spider. And uh, 